Try it. Test. <laughs> well, it's going up and down. Yeah.
minutes, finally. Yeah, everyone's ready then. Yes, because I got over to sit down five minutes ago because I thought it was ready. Well, we can look it up. The crowd. Yeah. Did you know how to turn it off? No. I didn't think so. Actually, no, no. It was off. It was off the one point. of the coolest things I ever saw yeah. was that we had a management meeting and yeah. we had like this guy who was really, really good and really Very excited about mobile phones. Like, if Adam ever went anywhere near his phone, he'd be like, Adam, is the rest of the service all right? And he'd be like, oh, oh sorry. And like, <laughs> put the device away. It's the longest I've ever seen him <laughs> disconnected from yeah. any kind of device in my entire life. Yeah, that's. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Howdy. Welcome to the Newcastle Coders Group. We're back again and it's great to see all of your smiling faces. I missed you all last year. So we want you to interact with us online. Go to Twitter, go to Meetup. We're at NCJU on Twitter. We're on Meetup there. We'd like you to RSVP. It helps us to buy the right number of sandwiches. And don't go to the Facebook page. I keep meaning to delete that line out of this slide every month and delete the page entirely. So don't go there, go to Meetup, go to Twitter. We also want you to speak, sponsor, host, or just share your ideas about what we could be running here at the Coders Group. So we were looking for people who want to do long talks. You can speak like Adam for, what are you going to speak for tonight, Adam? Hour, three? Yeah, not too long. Not too, not too long. You can speak for not too long like Adam, or you can speak for a short time. We're happy for you to get up and do five minutes if you've just seen some funky little thing and you thought it was pretty cool. And we want people who are seasoned professionals, but also people who want to get up and do their first talk. And it's a great intro to how you can get into conference speaking and get flown around the country or around the world if you game. So we have two sponsors here tonight. Obviously, SSW have provided this hosting space. They've provided our speakers, and they've provided all that food over there on the table. And then Safi provide us with some ongoing funds so we can do things like buy you all beer. We've got two speakers tonight. Matt's going to take us away with some news. And then Adam, who you'll all know as the most prolific Newcastle Coders Group speaker. I think his first talk was February 2006. And then he's spoken every year since then even the years that we had COVID. So he has done an amazing job for us and you'll keep that up tonight. But we are all weird meat sacks inhabiting this planet and we've all been at home isolated for a little while. So remember to be friendly, stand with open spaces as you're talking so that people can jump in, have a chat to you. Everyone here just wants to be friends. With that, I'll throw over to Matt and he can give us a little bit of news. I should be on. I am mic'd up. Okay, cool. Uh, news. I'll start off with, with the news that I found and then maybe open up the floor. Um, I think we'll start off with uh, New Relic. Anyone using New Relic here? No? No. Okay. Well, um, they changed their defaults and they're shipping your, your log data to their servers. So um, just be careful if. Um, 
your production log data doesn't have any secrets in it because uh, it's going to be sent to other servers that you may not be aware of. Um, so something to, to take into consideration. Use the application insights. <laughs> yeah. Are you going to talk about application insights? No. Okay. Use application insights. You heard it here first. Um, .NET MAUI. Anyone heard of .NET MAUI? Interested in it? Yes? Okay, well, there's a re release candidate too. Um, it's got a go live license like release candidate one, but this one has 100% more Tizen. Uh, Tizen is the operating system on the Samsung devices. So like that Samsung TV back there, we could build an app and um, actually control it with a TV remote control, which sounds a lot cooler than um, building a phone app for some reason. Because um, it's like it's a TV. It's, I don't know. Smart TVs are cool. Uh, Visual Studio 2022 from Mac. Anyone use a Mac? Yes, some, good. Okay, I'm not using a Mac at the moment. Um, but uh, 2022 RC is awesome. Uh, if anyone of the Mac users got an M1 processor? Yes, okay, you'll love this one. So um, they've gone silicon native. So it's not going through Rosetta. So here somebody's double clicked on a solution file waiting for it to load. The one on the left is the M1, obviously, and they're ready to code super quickly. The one on the right, they're still waiting, and their Intel chip is most probably very hot by now. Um, so I think that's really cool. Um, the other things, uh, how you can use .NET 6. So if you want to build some .NET 6 stuff on Mac, um, you could always use VS Code, which is awesome. Um, but you can use uh, VS 2022. Um, the Maui stuff that I just talked about, that's not coming for a little while yet. They want to stabilize it on Windows before bringing it over to Mac. Um, so that's really good for the Mac users out there. YARP 1.1. Anyone know what YARP stands for? Yep, yet another reverse proxy. Yeah, it's cool. Um, I love that, well, I was going to say TLAs, but this is more of an FLA. Um, so they've put out a new version, which is really good. If you're into performance because you use WebSockets or gRPC, you get some performance improvements there. Um, this version's built on .NET 6, so you're getting HTTP 3 support. Um, I don't think everyone's using HTTP 2 yet, so hey, it's ahead of the curve. Um, it's got some other cool things like adding middleware for your APIs. So instead of um, using a big, a big service like on Azure API management or um, yeah, API management, you can write your own and host it yourself. And um, hey, it's a pretty cool reverse proxy. So um, yeah, definitely look at it um, for, for your solutions. Um, anyone love dark mode? Yes, developers tend to like dark mode. Um, the .NET core team have changed the developer exception page to be in dark mode. Um, so we've gone from the yellow screen of death to that white and blue screen of death, and now we get a dark screen of death. Um, so you don't blind your eyes all of a sudden, because developers always love dark mode. Ha -ha. Anyone use WCF? Yes. Um, I, all on the .NET 3, .NET 4, probably not .NET 3, because that's really old. Um, .NET 5. So you may be using core WCF. Okay. Well, if you weren't moving away from WCF, the community, so this is a community project, they've ported it over to .NET Standard 2. So you can use core WCF on your .NET Core 3.1, uh, .NET 5, and .NET 6 projects if you still need it. Um, so there's a whole bunch of bindings that carried over from WCF. Uh, so your legacy applications can still be used. Um, community. Yeah. You got a question? No, it's a question. <laughs> so it is not, uh, my, well, as far as I know, it's only community supported because it is a community project. Uh, but in terms of Microsoft, uh, well, I guess not Microsoft support, but uh, Microsoft has put out a new preview of C Sharp 11. That's got a, a few cool things. Um, anyone use string interpolation in C Sharp? Yep, some people, cool. There's a cool thing called raw string literals. So if you've got, um, so like you wanna do a JSON blob, 
I don't know why, because there's other ways to do it. Um, but you may have this JSON string up here. Instead of going dollar sign around your quotes, you can put two dollar signs and three double quotes to make sure you're serious, um, and then put some JSON inside there. The cool thing is you don't have to escape the double quotes inside that literal. Um, so it makes it a lot easier to, to work with. Um, and if you're using, fix the zoom, uh, UTF-8, um, you've got access to that too. Um, anyone remember a little while ago there was, the c -sharp team was putting out um, the double bang on parameters for null checking, if some people do. Um, that's going away. So, um, <laughs> yeah, head down. Um, so, you know, Microsoft have put it out in preview, gotten some feedback, and now they're, you know, rethinking about that in terms of, you know, what they want to do with it. So at least we're not stuck with something half-baked. So that's really good that, you know, the community feedback is, is coming back and, you know, feeding these pro, uh, products. Uh, also, I have a question. You have a question. Yeah, why would they be removing that? Everybody would like it. Well, obviously, the, the feedback says that it may not be exactly what they want, so they're rethinking it to make sure when they ship it, everyone's going to be happy. Does anyone in this room not want this feature? Isn't it supposed to be a language JavaScript? Is it set? Uh, I think it's in Java. Java has the same kind of syntax. We've had this problem before. <laughs> OK, hand yeah. up, so Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a lot of online people. Okay, so um, it, the, the question was whether or not JavaScript does something like this, and it does. Um, it does. Uh, they're um, rethinking it for C Sharp. So C Sharp doesn't have to do everything that JavaScript does. In terms, in terms of uh, previews, there's a cool feature coming in uh, Visual Studio 17.2 Preview 2. I won't say that 10 times quickly. Um, which is really cool. So usually when you're viewing uh, an I enumerable, um, you have to go and, if I can zoom in, you have to go look at the I enumerable, click the little arrow that you know explodes it out, then you see a bunch of objects, click on object one, look at the properties, click on object two, look at the properties. It's really annoying. Um, this new preview tool, you can see there, they've got an I enumerable, um, then they're clicking on the, the view, and it's come up as a table, so it's a lot easier to see all the data at once. I think that will make working with I enum debugging I enumerable enumerables a lot easier. Hopefully, it does. Uh, the other cool thing is uh, central package management. Now, if you've got a, a .NET project, you're importing some you know, NuGet uh, projects, uh, you may use it multiple times in you know, different projects and then one version gets updated where the other ones get left behind. It's a little bit of you know, pain to manage. What you can do now is um, actually instead of storing them in the csproj or in the packages.config is you can have a directory.packages.props file, list them in one place and then it's readily available for other projects in that folder structure makes it a lot easier to upgrade everything in one hit as well and, and get some insight in there. So I think that's going to be really useful. Okay, Visual Studio got some uh, preview features as well in terms of you know searching your code. So you can um, click Control Q and Control T and um, get a, a good all-in-one search experience um, that kind of feels like Rider. So um, they're you know, taking a really good feature and um, integrating it, which is awesome. Not to be uh, outdone though, Rider shipped a new version and um, they think, so this is 2022.1, um, they've included a whole bunch of stuff with the Unreal Engine. So if you're, doing, if you're using that, you get a whole bunch of new features. Um, they've also included remote development. So if you're developing uh, locally and uh, on a remote machine, you can SSH into it and do some stuff. Um, and they've improved their search as well to stay ahead of the curve. So instead of just searching your code, it can search all the data files as well. There's a whole bunch of other features. Um, but let's leave those and... What's an example of a data file? A JSON file or a text uh, file, yeah. so CSV. Okay. There's a whole, 
whole bunch there. So they all appear and you can search through it just by um, changing the tabs that you're looking at. Uh, flicking over to GitHub, uh, anyone use git.io or know what it is? It was their URL shortening service. It's being deprecated. Um, so we'll move on. If you've got a uh, GitHub profile, you want to you know, have some privacy around it, you can make your profile private now. So you don't need to, to show off to everyone. And you can hide private contributions and things like that from, from the internet. Uh, GitHub also did a whole bunch of work to improve um, you know, pre-receive hooks and push times. So they're kind of saying that it's 95% you know, faster now. And um, that's really useful if you're using something like you know, GitHub Enterprise and you're using the code scanning features, uh, the secret scanning features on the pre. So they've, you're able to scan for secrets as a pre-receive hook so the secrets don't actually make it onto GitHub. Um, and speeding that up is going to, um, you're going to feel that benefit too. And finally, uh, anyone use Windows Power Toys? Yep. Um, so they pushed a new version. Uh, I know it's just an, a little new version, but the thing that I thought was cool was um, they were using .NET Core 3.1. That's all been removed. And now Power Toys runs on .NET 6. So um, .NET 6 everywhere. It's pretty awesome. Anyone else got some news from this month? Yes, Claire. Elon Musk bought Twitter. That's kind of <laughs> the news over the month. You missed something pretty big there. So for $54.20 or 50 plus 420. So it'll be interesting to see what happens to Twitter. Does anyone have an opinion on that? Can I just ask the sentiment? Who is happy and who is not happy? So who is, like if you have to say happy or not, one way or the other, who is happy? Mm. Less than half. Who is not happy? Actually about a bit more. All right, okay. Right. Ambivalent. Does anyone feel strongly about it one way or the other? No, most people don't care too much, right? Does anyone <laughs> wish they bought Twitter shares before Elon bought? <laughs> before? All right. Um, have any thoughts? I kind of wish I bought shares, that's about it. Oh, that's what you think. Yeah, I mean, oh. it's, it's a free service. It sounds like he's going to charge for business use, whereas it was free before, but um, it doesn't really change my day. Yeah, I wish I bought Dogecoin. No, anything Elon does makes Doge go up. <laughs> I find spike. it uh, quite baffling because obviously he's completely snowed under, like he's so busy. And he has some distractions, like those, uh, what are those guns that he has? And he, he, even the Boring Project is like a, a small distraction, really. But this is like uh, a fifth of his wealth. This is not- He borrowed a lot to do it. <laughs> yeah, so this is not just the money, but he, he's gonna be harassed by the US Congress forever. Like every issue that comes up, he, this is going to be a massive time sink. So the thing doesn't make any money, so he hasn't done it for money. I think I think the only thing I can think of is just like I would like to own my website, so nobody <laughs> nobody can take it away from me. Uh, I think just a rich person wants to own the platform, so he can't get taken off like he saw Trump taken off. I don't believe any of this. Um, what, what is it? Uh, Free speech stuff. I don't believe any of that because he's called people pedophiles, and he's he's not unfree to speak his mind. I don't get any of that. I, I just think he's worried about losing. You know, it's too valuable for him. He uses it too much. Or is this tes Tesla's advertising budget? Is Elon Musk doing this stuff, and that's how they oh, yeah. stay notable? Yeah, that's right. They don't spend anything on advertising. Yeah, no. it's a good point. Yeah, excellent. Mm. Anyway, that's the news for this month. Uh, so yeah. one other one is oh, one other. that for people in my age bracket, I don't know how many are here, Microsoft today open sourced the code for 3D Movie Maker. So if you played with that game as a child, you can now go download it, build it, and hopefully run it again. Still, it never works. <laughs> 
hear a directional microphone just pointed at people. No, I don't have a directional microphone. I um, don't know if it's business news or IT news, but the H C fining uh, Uber um, 26 200 million something dollars uh, and the thing that they were doing wrong was um, popping up a dialogue warning people that they'd be charged for a, a cancelling a ride that they'd booked and the other one was um, their algorithm that calculated the comparative cost if they caught a taxi for the same thing and um, yeah I think what I found interesting is that their explanation was that one team within Uber developed it and then another team used it and then they just failed to monitor its effectiveness over time and over time it became less effective or, yeah. So, that's it. Anybody else? Before we wrap up and let Adam do his thing. Okay. All right. In well, that I'll case, over to you, Adam. before we do that, toilets are through there. Don't take the doorstop out of the way or you'll get locked out. So, if you do get locked out, go out the back, around the corner, out the front. You're not really locked out. Yes, and uh, be aware when you use the toilets, um, there is a nice effect when you're out in the park where the, the lights go on and off as you go up, which isn't a nice effect when you're using the toilet because the lights go off. But anyway, <laughs> as long as it looks good from the outside, that's all that matters. So, uh, we have Clay, but we don't have Peter. Where is Peter? Peter has to go and drop his off. He wants to get home. All right, we'll let him off. But uh, thank you, Clay, and thanks, Peter, for all the uh, support you do for this group forever. So long. Uh, it's, it's, a great, uh, it's a great thing for Newcastle, and uh, I've enjoyed it before I kind of moved into this area. Um, I really love my Newcastle office. I think it's awesome. It's our fourth city in Australia. I think it's the fourth best choice to come to. The internet here along this strip is the lightning fast, 900 megabytes. I'm pretty happy about that. I think the digital initiative is wonderful. Um, the beaches are the closest beaches we have. I've just been in Melbourne all week and uh, saw one of those beaches. Uh, it's not really a beach. It's more like uh, a lake, I guess. Um, there is one thing wrong with this place. Does anyone know what it is? What's the worst thing about Newcastle? Airport. The airport! Bingo! That is well done, Jeremy. Excellent, excellent. I didn't know if anybody else would experience it. Who's experienced the airport? Oh, okay. Well, I don't know. Look, I have a small sample size of flying in here because I usually drive. But I was in Melbourne last night and flying here. There's not that many flights, which I, uh, when the pilot said, I can't get my window closed, uh, and it was the last flight, and I start looking up, I realise, oh, it's not going to be easy to get to Newcastle on another flight tomorrow. I could have downsized to Jetstar, but uh, that would have, most of the plane, I, prop I think, were already booking. So uh, then he says, uh, good news. We are trying to find another plane. And then they said, bad news, that there is a 10 p.m. curfew. Uh, that is trouble, but we're trying our best. Anyway, they get us off. I don't know why they kept us off so long, but they get us back on the plane, and they get us to the runway, and then they hold us up for another 10, 15 minutes where they're saying, we're getting permission to land because we're going to be late. I'm thinking, you're going to be later. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we fly in to the airport. Qantas come off. Uh, they take us off, they get some taxis, I don't think about this too much. The rest of the plane is there. Uh, late at night at the airport, um, there's no Ubers, no DDs, no taxis, and uh, we are there from 10pm to midnight. And uh, anyway, they're very apologetic of the whole thing, but anyway, a lot of, lot of fun at that airport. Yes, I was quite worried, there was a... There was uh, there was a, a girl there that was heading off to the Colburn or somewhere and she looked like she was going to be the last one standing and she didn't want to be at that airport by herself, <laughs> last one. Uh, so the, so we, there was four, four big guys and, and me. Somehow we squeezed into one taxi 
Uh, that was fun. Um, so I will also say uh, thank you to Penny for organising tonight, getting all the food, doing all the social medias, uh, all good stuff. That's great. Um, uh, I did take a little video of my event last night. This is, here we go. This is, and here are the last people at midnight. Yes. One, one, uh, one of, there's the lady. None of them were particularly happy. I was going to try to interview them, but I thought it, uh, against it. <laughs> I, I did speak to, uh, I did speak to uh, one of the guys. He's the, um, uh, the, a, a, what, what's the top soccer level? A-League, a, a yeah. He, see, I didn't know that. I felt like a fool. I said A-League, oh, so not Premier League. And then I worked out that is Premier League. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. So anyway, uh, he's also a lawyer. Interesting guy. So um, we also have the TV uh, team here in the back. Um, they uh, run this TV channel and you have this thing running tonight, um, live streamed. Uh, we've got about 35,000 subscribers and uh, there we are. We could probably even watch, uh, watch ourselves there. That would be fun. Um, now, if you notice, I might just uh, show you a little bit. Uh, that, I took a photo earlier and there you go. That's them setting up. And if you look closely up the top, they have a PTZ camera there. Okay? And there is one here looking at you guys. And uh, that is pretty cool. If you look close, they've got that uh, ATEM uh, kind of keyboard. That is like a keyboard for programmers, but for TV guys that uh, allows them to uh, you know, control the camera, uh, vid you know, record stuff, uh, cut stuff, do what they need to do. And in fact, we use this you know, obviously for an event like this, but also we do a lot of done videos for the projects we're working on. So they, you know, remotely controlling cameras, uh, pretty cool. They can do this from Sydney uh, into the different offices with all that cool gear. So, uh, yeah. Uh, add to that, there's still the Q&A. I'll go into the presentation. Uh, if anyone has a question, if you want to grab the mic and come and stand on that green line, then this camera will be looking at you and that will be in the video that, that will be published. Yes. So it's probably the best, best way to do it. Yes, so you'll be famous, obviously, um, with all the, there's obviously a lot more people online than there are in person, uh, and a, a hell of a lot more that watch the video after. Um, once you've been on SSW TV, the next step is Hollywood, okay? <laughs> now, what does PTZ stand for? How many people know? Just a couple, not very good. Uh, so. Uh, I had to look it up myself because I didn't know. We have a lot of rules, but we also have a lot of internal standards. And uh, these guys have a lot. It stands for pan, tilt, and zoom. zoom. There we go. You left that off the standard, Landon. You better add that. It's only pan and tilt. Oh, uh, zoom. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very good. You should bold that sentence. Yes. But anyway, they, they have a lot of standards. Yes, and they, uh, they often use Teams to record, so if somebody's remote, this is a hot tip, uh, with Teams you can turn on NDI from uh, the server levels and then they can record in much higher stream. So that's uh, how that cookie is made. Yeah, that goes on and on and on and on and on, a lot of fun. But yes, and they also have a whole lot of... Uh, public rules about uh, how they make that work, but for the devs, which is the main thing, they're recording a lot of quick and dirty done videos, and that's, uh, that's how that works. Um, that's just one of many of the rules. Uh, how many people are familiar with the rules? I know you have rules. Ah, <laughs> who reads them every day? All right, and uh, that is Penny's hard work. That is fantastic. And uh, I have just a couple of other things I wouldn't mind showing you. Um, the guys put this up yesterday. I thought it looked good. We, we do an internal, because uh, obviously I'm on these, this is about a few years ago, I, I was noticing on some internal calls with Microsoft how many resources went into dark mode. And I'd never used dark mode and I didn't understand. This seems crazy. So I did an internal survey at SSW. Who likes dark mode in their phone? Who likes dark mode on the computer who 
who wants their visual studio with dark mode, blah, 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 blah. And I learned that almost the whole company loves dark mode. So then I, that was, the, uh, that sign is dark mode. Uh, we also put the building, what is the building colors now? Ukraine. Ukraine, there we go. So very nice. All right. Uh, I have a question just to confirm the room's uh, opinion. We had this this morning. We have this now. So that was this morning. That is now. Who likes this one the most? Two, three, Rochi. Yes. The average age is 55. Okay. And who likes this? Oh, 95% of the room. Rochi, don't you feel terrible? Oh, you don't? Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's jump into uh, 10 tips to rocking as an Azure architect. And uh, this talk essentially is a collection uh, cut down from all the devs at SSW. Uh, lots of varying opinions on what is important. Uh, I'm going to cover a fair bit, but I want to talk about the Architecture Center. I want to talk about BICEP. I want to talk about uh, Azure dollars, always a painful topic. Should be free, shouldn't it? Uh, and uh, lots more rules to better Azure. Uh, primary cloud, Azure, AWS, Google Cloud. Who's on Google Cloud as their primary platform? All right, Jeremy, okay. There's one, there's always one in every room. Um, and who is primary platform AWS? Just a couple. Why are they here? <laughs> who let them in? All right. Whose primary cloud is Azure? All right. And there's a few didn't put their hands up. Are you on-premise? <laughs> on-premise? Where's your stuff? I just built my stuff in Netlify. Netlify. Well, that's another cloud, yes. All right. Okay, any others? No IBMers? All right, good, good, good. All right, this is me. Um, I am the Chief Architect at SSW. I am also a Microsoft Regional Director. My favorite job is being a Scrum Master and I have a blog, okay? Um, this, we have a little mobile app. You can scan this and install the app and by watching the talk, you get points and you win these things, uh, bands, different, different bits and pieces, all right. So uh, many years ago, I think I started this in about 2016, I started doing a talk on Azure was just so enormous. I think, um, you know, we, we had started, we'd done one of the very first projects on Azure and at the time we used 100% of Azure, um, which wasn't very hard because there's only like four services. Um, and then it started blowing out. There was a lot and we're trying to work out what, what like, it's big, what, what do we do? And so uh, I wrote a talk, which was the Nine Nights of Azure. And that is, uh, this is here's a bit of a, a summary of that blog. But uh, that blog, th that talk I did in, oh, heaps and heaps of countries around the world. Um, I did it for probably a year and a half, I guess. I did get to one city where when I asked what was their number one cloud, 90% of the room put up their hand for Google Cloud. Okay, I'd never seen it before. It was in Linz in Austria. Okay, so know that it's very popular there. If you meet an Austrian, they're probably using Google Cloud. All right, and so I went through uh, the most, in, what I thought was the most important stuff at the time. Wasn't sure what would live and what, was, uh, what wouldn't, but you know, app services. Uh, the DevOps project, now that was a bit of a, uh, does anyone use that? It's kind of still there, but it's not popular. Uh, people don't really care about that project anymore. Uh, I said Cosmos was going to be important. It had just kind of got going. And um, uh, security, uh, Azure AD and uh, uh, Azure AD B2C. Uh, talked about that stuff, all the social logins, and that's panned out pretty popular. We use that on plenty of projects these days. Um, I talked about web API management as something that was brand new. Uh, that's panned out to be pretty good. Um, yep, sing out if you have different opinions. Logic apps, wow, well that turned out great. Um, in fact, 
We now aren't just a company of .NET developers and you know, React and Angular developers. We have a little department of power platform people, like low code people that get a hell of a lot of stuff done, you know, Dynamics, you know, uh, Power Apps, uh, you know, Logic Apps, uh, Flow, all that type of stuff. They get a lot done uh, cheaply, well, cheaply in the beginning, you know, the, the, uh, the fees are there, but boy, they're, they're pretty awesome. Even inside our own company, we have a lot of this stuff now. Uh, so that panned out. Uh, uh, the cognitive services, I thought that would be much bigger than it is. Um, you know, uh, one thing that I think is missing from the vision one here is form recognizer. So that is kind of popular, turning paper forms automatically into data. Um, that ended up being popular. Uh, we use um, Q&A Maker ourselves, uh, but generally I wouldn't say many client projects are using much of this. Anyone got different experiences? No? Okay. And then uh, bots. Well, we haven't been asked heaps about bots from clients, but we use bots internally a heap, heaps and heaps. It's, it's the first thing on everyone's computer, the, our bot. And if I want to know about um, uh, who is Matt, okay, uh, it will tell me or it will ask me which Matt are you, are you talking about and I will choose Matt Wicks and we'll see what he's doing. Uh, he's not doing anything at the moment. <laughs> no, it copies my talk to you for your presentation. Uh, yes, it can. There we go. Matt Wicks. All right. So, um, oh. That's a bit of news, it's the happiest news of the, uh, the year. Matt Wixey uh, returning to SSW. Uh, he was last seen in Newcastle six months ago. Uh, what's going on there? He hasn't connected to our Wi-Fi. All right. Um, yes, but anyway, that's what he does. And if I want to uh, view what projects he's on or what is his current bookings, I could click that and see what bookings he's, you know. Um, yeah, I can ask. Uh, uh, a million different questions. Um, and so bots have panned out to be pretty good. I'm, I'm pretty happy with bots. Anyone using bots? Nope, haven't made it to Newcastle. Okay, so uh, containers, I think they're being popular. But I think out of those nine, I think, uh, you know, I think probably seven are fairly strong. So, all right, we'll see, we'll see about tonight. All right. So anyway, there were the ones that I talked about um, in that session back then. All right, any questions on any of that uh, stuff prior? All right, let's talk about going Azure architecture shopping, okay? So you are talking to a client on, you know, we're trying to work out what our client needs or what this project will need. And you really have to go and, and work out what's there and then you kind of have to get team buy-in and stuff like that. Um, obviously, it is easier to talk to clients and other team members with a picture. So, does anyone have a favorite way of putting together all the pieces they're picking? You know, apps, app services and databases and we'll use that and we'll use that. Anyone have a favorite way? Miro, yes, okay. That Miro is very good. Um, uh, it's uh, sometimes used for um, that. It's used for journey mapping. It's used for um, you know nice diagrams. Any others? Draw.io, yes. Draw. Uh, who's using Draw.io? Okay. Uh, I think it's been renamed to Diagrams.net. They had some problems with the .io domain, which is owned by the Indian Ocean. <laughs> .io is Indian Ocean, and there's a bit of chaos around that domain, so they renamed to diagrams.net. But anyway, so um, in our spec reviews, what we will typically do is, and I'll just show you one of our rules here, is using the Azure Architecture Center. This is the, uh, the, the goodies, um, but you can come here and find some uh, complete built-up end-to-end scenarios, which are quite nice. Uh, and then they link off to all the, the best practices of how to put that together. So if you're trying to do this 
rather than reinvent the, the wheel straight away, this is your friend, your, your Azure Architecture Center. Um, you can browse uh, existing uh, Azure architectures. Uh, you could say, all right, look, I definitely want to use, uh, well, it's definitely going to use .NET, it's definitely going to use GitHub, blah, blah, blah. And then you come into one of these uh, uh, architectures and you see how the, this could be put together, okay? And some of this is drawn up for you. So this um, can be quite useful. I think that should be the, your first port of call to get going. Alrighty. Um, now, I might just um, show you another one. This is uh, design a CI CD pipeline with Azure DevOps, fairly standard, and it puts together what you'll need. Okay, and how the whole thing will go. This is a, a very, this is, this is like gold, this stuff. Anyone already used this in the past? No one. So that is a, that's a pretty hot tip if you have not. This is the, this is the, the key to, to understanding uh, Azure. And it's very, put, put one of these, you know, like we often turn up to a client and they're just, they're just talking to us for the first day and they just want to, they don't really know what they've got. They've got what they've got now, they've got a bit of a pipe dream, but you know, you listen to it all. If you put this there, all right, so you want this? No, I don't want that bit, and I don't want that. All right, it gives you a good starting point, and it's quite um, visual. It really uh, aids in a conversation. All right, so um, now what these don't include is ARM um, JSON or ARM um, bicep files. You're going to have to do that yourself but uh, it's, I think it's quite nice. Now, um, uh, I'm just going to mention, just at this point, I think it's worth saying, this rule here about uh, having a cloud architect on your projects is fairly important. You can do, you know, which is typical in a lot of projects, you have a couple of strong developers doing this, but you don't have a cloud architect, you don't have anyone looking at how much the different pieces are costing. You've just got the devs doing the work. Um, I generally will say, yeah, you want to have some strong developers and a cloud architect, even if it's just a small portion of that project. Um, the three big things that that person is looking after is load and performance and uh, automating that so you're having a look at it, um, your security stuff and your Spend, spending, we call it spend ops, but you know how much you're paying for that stuff. All right, any um, any questions on this one? Okay, so that's uh, this is essentially what you should be doing. There's there's the rule I just showed you. All right, let's talk about um, infrastructure as code. Okay, so does anyone already practice infrastructure as code? Okay, we got, oh, half the room. Okay. And preferred tooling, how do you do it? ARM templates? Nope. Terraform. Terraform. Okay. All right. So, um, Desmond, how long have you been using Terraform? Four. Four years. All right. You're married to it. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, how much is Terraform? It's not free. Pretty free? Is it free? Pretty free. Pretty free, exactly. What's the pretty? What's the, why do we need the word pretty? I guess you have to learn it. It's pretty free. Okay, so there's no there's no license cost. Okay, good. Um, anyone else using something different? Right. All right. Well, I am going to uh, tell you that uh, this is what we will generally tell you. The, the bottom line is you don't want to be uh, going in and manually creating resources. You don't want to be uh, creating, um, well, ARM templates are generally, a, so this, this way just manually going in creating stuff is not the way to do it. Uh, manually creating things and saving a script as an ARM template is the most common way of doing things. Uh, the best way in the Azure world the, these days would be to be using bicep, okay? And there's a few examples. We, we've got the farmer example here by um, Matt Wicks, very bad example. Um, was good, good for a time. 
Uh, that was the s that was the F sharp one, wasn't it, Matty? Yeah. Yeah. Very nice to read. Yes. Okay. So here's the recommended one. That is the that is the logo you would be looking for. That is the good choice. Now this is supported by Microsoft, loved by Microsoft. Okay. So this is the way to do it. Um, now there are some other ones that cost a lot of money. All right, Pulumi is um, one, and uh, obviously Terraform is one. So do you use Terraform because you might cross clouds? Do you have some specific reasons why that's chosen? Yeah, it's because we have multiple cloud providers, and we didn't want to tie ourselves down to one of them. Okay. So we use it for AWS too instead of using um, cloud formation. Yep, uh, so I think. Desmond's got a good reason there, so if you're worried about that, that's good. Uh, Matt, do you have any comments on that? So Terraform's pretty cool. You can also get it um, to automate other services. So you can get it to um, you know, create GitHub repos and organizations, add users, things like that. You're not restricted to just cloud platforms. You can branch out as well and do um, other things. There's like 1,500 providers um, that are available. So I recommend that you give them both a try and see what you think. Uh, I'd definitely be interested to know which way you, you would go. All right, so uh, let's go on. Uh, so if you go down the, um, this bicep route, you're going to come here. You're gonna install this guy and then you're, uh, you're good to go, okay? And so this, this would be the route you'd go and uh, you can, uh, you've got a very nice uh, way of creating your Azure resources. All right. So um, now when you do this, each file is essentially a module and each file can call another file, okay? And you can put it into um, Azure Container Registry and um, it will be very easy to essentially rebuild what you have, okay? All right, now um, uh, William Leenberg has done a nice little example of this. You can come in here and have a look. Um, he, uh, he did a talk here as well. So you could have a look at his PowerPoint, there it is. Let's have a look. It's a five meg uh, PowerPoint, no, it's a PDF. So there you go. Uh, he's done a really good job here, okay? And uh, yeah, so you can have a look through this. I think that uh, that's a really nice way of putting it. Oh, and he's also, not only that, I'll just flick through just so you can see it. So he walks through this. I don't think he has a recording of it. We should get him to do a recording. Um, but uh, he has some example files here, maybe demos. Uh, registries, full stack web app, maybe this guy. Yeah, but anyway, you can have a look at how he's done this sample. And basically, you know, each each module, you'll you know have a app service, you'll have a database, you'll have key vault, you know, auth stuff. Um, and then that's all wrapped together here in a nice file rather than that's essentially replayable. All right. So here's the big one. What's your monthly spend? Who knows what their, what their project's monthly spend is? Just a couple. Oh, that's very sad. All right. What's going on? So Desmond, do you care what your monthly spend is? I noticed you don't put your hand up. You, you, you know it? Definitely, we know and care. Oh, how come you didn't raise your hand? Uh, it's not something I want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you don't raise your hand, I'm going to ask you questions. <laughs> All right. So this is a, uh, a difficult topic. And often you ask, uh, you know, the boss who's kind of in charge of some of this stuff, you know, what's, what's it costing? So let's just use a scenario where they've just got a simple web app, they've got a database, they've got some reports. Um, they will often say, no FI. Okay, no uh, idea, all right? 
Uh, and that's, that's not a good situation. In addition, when you ask them what it will be in 12 months, most, most clients can't tell you. Uh, I guess they haven't thought about it. It doesn't take them a lot to think, but uh, they don't know this stuff off the top of their head. Now, the answer is the pricing calculator. Who's used this before? Okay, all right, we've got a quarter of you. That's good, all right. So this pricing calculator is really only for fairly smart people because uh, they make it a little difficult. Oh my God, I just accidentally added one. Look at that, I just added one accidentally. Now, uh, let's just assume that, uh, let's assume that the client is considering something standard, normal. They're considering a, um, a web app, they're considering they're going to have a .NET Core middle tier uh, and they'll have a SQL database because they know and love that. So this thing looks like it's loading, doesn't it? No, it never loads. You'll probably wait there for a few minutes and then realise. You'll then refresh the page and then wonder what's going on. Anyway, so we'll just come up here and we'll choose App Service. What that did was add it down here. And there's my app service. So let's just go through this. Oh, $54. Cool, cool. Okay, now let's assume the client's budget is, I don't know, let's say $150 a month. That's a, for this little thing. They, they say, yeah, I'm comfortable with $150 a month. Good, 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 good. All right, what's the first thing to do? Well, even though I'm logged in, oh, no, I'm not logged in, sorry. That's not good. I should log in just to prove. All right, so now I'm not nicely logged in. It knows I'm, I'm an Aussie, but it will still, uh, I'll still have to keep choosing this every time. So I'll come down here, and which one is Australia? Where's Newcastle? It's missing. So we'll choose Sydney. All right, that's Sydney. Now, of course, it's $68, 70 bucks. What's the first thing to do? Switch back to the US. Switch back to the West US. <laughs> <laughs> that is one way. <laughs> okay. Or you can go Linux. <laughs> okay, all right. Oh, basic. Basic is really for dev test, but we'll need to go production, so we can't tell the client dev test costs. We will want to, uh, we'll need to auto scale. There's no point being on Azure without auto scale, right? So we'll come in here and we'll go standard. All right, we will see 90 bucks a month. Oh, what the hell? I have to come down here and choose Australia. I wish it put the little country flag next to that so I didn't see the wrong figure regularly. Okay, as soon as I see American flag, I get warning symbols and I'd fix it. Or better still, remember I'm an Aussie and use that. Um, and by the way, I have chosen Australia East uh, 5,000 times and it still doesn't remember. That's what I would choose. It still thinks I want to go in <laughs> to America. Okay. Okay, so that's pretty good, 120 bucks, right? Oh, but we still have a database. But, and, that, and by the way, this is the point that a lot of devs stop at. You are paying 120 bucks a month uh, because they'll go, oh, you know what I would? I wouldn't mind more than two gig of RAM. I'd like four gig of RAM, okay? Oh, 240 bucks. Oh, that's going to blow the budget because the client wants 150 bucks and I still need a database. So they go, oh, 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 oh no, let's just keep on this, right? That's a typical way. So we're 120 bucks. Now, be aware that you might, you can do this instead. You can move to premium V2, uh, which is just a little bit more. And I've got four gig of RAM. Isn't that good? And that also gives me uh, SSD. So they should put a little tick. You get an SSD for this. They should um, tell you that you're getting private endpoints for this. You're getting WAF, you know, um, Web Application Framework. So, you know, you can use Front Door and different things like that. So, that is one way. Uh, I guess you might even then say, well, that's pretty good. What's V3? And you go, 189. Oh, no, 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 I can't do that. I don't want to go past. I've got a budget of 150, right? And I need the other one. So, what do you do now? You ask the client, how long is this, like, what's your commitment to this project, your app? It's usually very easy to get them to say a year, okay? So, 
you get them to choose this, and now we're back to 120. That's, these are simple questions to ask, and the, the numbers pan out better. All right, so there we've got that. Um, you know, you can keep going, but you'll see that things start blowing out a little bit more when you start getting more expensive. Uh, or, but you can go up, but you'll be paying a lot more. But that's a comfortable way of working if you can get them to commit to three years, which is a lot harder. Um, but there you go. So then we need a database, don't we? So there's a, let's go SQL Server. Okay, that's always nice. Oh, it added it down here. So I've got that, so I can, I can um, pull this up. There's 120, and we've got a SQL database. Whoa, whoa, hold on. Hold the horses there. $2,000. All right. That's sticker shock. Uh, what do I do? Well, we tell it again that we don't want to be in America. You like? <laughs> so, why can't they just put Sydney here? I hate translating east. Okay. At least we don't have to say southeast. That's Melbourne. Okay. So, we come in here and, uh, well, that did jack. Oh, no, it didn't. Made it more expensive. Okay. So, this is buying, um, you know, physical cores where it's better to choose DTU. Okay. That's uh, data transmission units. So we'll come in here. Oh, that's much more reasonable. <laughs> Seven bucks. All right. I'm much happier with that. But you really uh, cannot deploy on basic. You are going to have to move to standard. Okay. Otherwise, you're going to be uh, uh, Bryden. And we got a mic for Bryden. Uh, do you know off the top of your head why you would never go with basic? Let's see. Um, on basic, you're getting five transaction units. <laughs> that will not do very much work at all. Probably just to select out of your, if you've say got a product table, yep. that will be right. all of your transaction units for a second. Good for demo. Um, yeah. Now, if I ever have pricing questions, I ask um, Bryden, because Bryden has spent more money than, uh, than Newcastle has spent on its airport. All right? <laughs> he... He has spent a couple million dollars a year on just Cosmos DB. He is like an expert with pricing. So, you ever got a problem? Uh, hit him up. What's your Twitter account? <laughs> <It doesn't laughs> He's too old for Twitter. He doesn't use Twitter. All right, don't worry. What is it? At Brian Nolder? Yes, I think it is. Uh, he thinks. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. We I'm looked I last tweeted in 2014. Okay, that's not a badge of honor. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anyway, now what, what you've learned fairly quickly is I've done something that's in a reasonable dollars. Okay, there you are at, uh, you know, uh, 150 bucks. The client's fairly happy. You've used a little bit of logic. Now, there's a lot more to go through than this. Uh, what you can do is say, all right, but we have another scenario there. What's the other scenario? The, um, we could do this as a static site and we could be, we need some Azure functions. We are using Cosmos DB. That's kind of a, a nice way to go. So you can come in here and we can come in here and we'll just wait for this page to load. Uh, no, it will never load. Okay. This is, this is called skeleton design. You usually use this design to let the user know something's about to come. But the geniuses that put this together just thought you might want to just look at it. Okay. So uh, I am going to come in here and I'm going to select uh, what I'd like. So, uh, what am I, I am after static sites. Well, it's not there. Maybe I'll go into web. There's static web apps. There, that's what we like. By the way, if you look at something like um, SSW rules, that, that was all moved from, well, it was once on SharePoint. It was moved to static sites. So, this is a static site, okay? And that's why when you click on things, it's uh, very fast, all right? <laughs> fast and cheap. That's what you like, isn't it? And that's static web apps. Uh, can I give this a name? Yes, I am going to go. Let's go. We'll call this cool and static web app. And uh, you can come back here and can I call this? I might call this normal uh, app service. 
All right, there we go. So that's that price, and this is this price, and we'll compare. Uh, you can't use free for this stuff because uh, although you get uh, Azure Functions for free, you do get stuff for free, um, but you don't get lots, you don't get the whole Azure Functions. You get like Azure Functions crippled. You don't get durable functions and cool stuff. So let's go into standard, nine bucks a month. Ah, oh, not again. Where is the flag? All right, come down here. Now, isn't it great that Australia it starts with A? You know, I was asked the other day, what should I name my child? And I said, anything that starts with A. I've always been at the top of every list. It's always helpful. And there we go, Australia. You didn't name your girl with an a. I didn't name my girls with an A, but there's a long story. You are right. My girls, my wife is Greek, and I didn't know this when I got married, but there is a tradition that my names were already chosen. I wasn't very happy when I found out. <laughs> and I was even less happy when I found out my daughter was about to be called Stavrula. Because I'd never heard of that name. Because I didn't know my mother-in-law's name was Stavrula. And uh, I said, Stavrula, it's like, you, you're often called Ruler. I thought she was called Ruler because she was like the head of the house. But she's called Ruler. And then I said, Ruler, kind of like Ruby. That's pretty close. No, actually, I said Stephanie first. I was trying to find something I could remember because I couldn't remember Stavrula at the time. Stephanie! And she said, no, you, could, you can find a Stephanie to look after your grandchildren, you know, to look after your kids. And I said, oh, that's not good. So then I went with Ruby. And I said, it's almost the same as Ruler. Like, they almost the same. It's just different spelling. Anyway, it was a lot of pain. All right. So um, there we go. It's 12 bucks a month. I am pretty happy with that. I will still need, uh, I'll still need a database. So I'll go up and get Cosmos. That's pretty popular. There we go. There's Cosmos. Okay, added down here. Let's have a look at Cosmos. Okay, I'll just um, shrink this up. Stay clever. By the way, choosing this new stuff is a little easier because you know they throw in a lot of stuff. It's kind of everything you need. Do you see how it's quicker to go through? Um, well, I probably could. No, oh, do I have to choose Australia again? Here we go. Am I the only one that hates this? Okay, there we go. Um, good enough. I could maybe go a year, a year. Okay. Now. Uh, that just became expensive. Um, I want to make it cheaper. You can't on that. All right, that's not a good way to go. We're going pay as you go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that will have to be my my price. Anyway, what do you think of that? At least I got it cheaper than the other one. All right, any. Oh, and by the way, I can't collapse this support. Support is included. And what I found, uh, what I find interesting is most clients don't seem to choose extra support. They go with what's included. Am I incorrect? Anyone got a different experience? No? They're happy with what's included. All right. So even though they force this thing to be open and never collapse it, people don't choose it. Um, all right. Any questions? Uh, comments from you, Bryden, on this uh, Azure Cosmos? So that base level at 400 RUs, that, that's giving you a fair amount of compute. So you'll get um, pretty good performance on small apps with that. So that's probably adequate for most small apps. Okay. And uh, should I be going one year reserve capacity or pay as you go? Well, at that small, you can only go pay as you go. If you're using a lot more of Cosmos, yeah, the one you've reserved, I think, is 25% cheaper, and then it's 35 if you go to three years. Mm. So it's quite a big saving. Right. Okay. If you're prepared to commit. Okay. So there you can see, you can give the client um, your normal app service for, uh, where's, my f where's my full price? Down. Why don't they put it at the top? Uh, there we go. One, 150 a month versus this guy 
at uh, uh, all the way down at 50 bucks. All right, that's good. All right, any questions on costing? No, great. So, uh, use the pricing calculator, that's the way to go. Here is some uh, samples of what you can give to a client. And so, you can't really propose an architecture with adding, without adding the costs. So, uh, make sure you remember, always remember, you should be able to put one year to get a big discount. Um, now, things end up looking a little bit like this uh, and, you know, for uh, enterprises. So things start getting a, a little bit more expensive when they want all the goodness. Then you need to make sure that you're monitoring the cost. You basically want to be looking at a graph. So if anything spikes quickly, you go, what the hell happened? All right. So that is Azure Cost Management. And that is um, what a... <laughs> what Azure costs look like in reality a lot, okay? Oh, okay. So, um, now, alerts. Alerts are pretty important to have because you want to know when you're getting, when things are running out of control. When that car's handbrake fails and it's flying down the hill, you want to know very quickly. Uh, at, uh, Bryden, you have alerts always? I would always put on alerts. You'll see it just underneath the cost analysis in the, that bar there, that second bar across. Just under the cost analysis, you've got cost alerts. Yep. Troy Hunt's got a great um, blog post about this. So he didn't have alerts on and his cache failed. And $14,000 later, he, he realised. Yes. And I don't think he was very happy to be paying 14000 extra a month on a site but he that did normally wangle, costs a He did wangle something dollars. with Microsoft. Yeah. Yes, they did. Yes, he publicly, if you've got a big tweet and 100,000 followers, you can make a bit of a noise. Yes. So, yeah, so that, that is pretty important. Now, shouldn't have they said to him, you should have set up alerts? Mm. Mm -hmm. They probably did wrap him over the knuckles. All right. Any comments on that stuff? Okay. Um, all right. Now, what have you got on-prem? Who has stuff still on-prem? A little bit. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's, that's very naughty. Don't point at me. <laughs> Don't point at me. All right. <laughs> all right. Now, Rochi, what have you got? Nothing on, on cloud? On on uh, on premise. Very good, very good. How long did that take you? I've changed jobs. Oh, that's how you fix. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you fix the problem. That is gold. That is wonderful. Okay, now uh, the problem with stuff on premise when you're talking to a customer is they consider that a cost done, and they're only considering new costs. Uh, I can tell you when one of our sands failed in uh, Sydney and we decided, well, we had to get rid of it, was kaput. Uh, boy, did the air conditioning bill go down. Those things generate a lot of heat and they're a lot of, a lot of expense and uh, the cost of that should be factored in, okay? Most uh, clients will say they don't know. So you want to use this TCO calculator, okay? And this basically will take you through what your workloads are, uh, what databases you have, it will run through basically the costs of what this thing is costing you. And it's quite handy. Um, uh, you will see fairly quickly that that thing is actually costing uh, a fair bit of money and this is very helpful to quickly tell the customer, well, really, this is what it's costing you and put this very quickly into the proposal. It will be a good kick start to getting them to put more effort into the cloud, okay? All right, learning about Azure. What is your favorite way of learning about Azure? How do you guys get more stuff, more information in your head? Rochi, what is the way you do it? Channel 9. Channel 9. Um, I'm assuming you mean Microsoft Channel 9? Of course. Yes. All right. Clay, what's your favorite way? NBN, of course, NBN TV. No, <laughs> MTV. Um, no, I come listen to Adam Kogan talk at the Coders Group. 
It's my ah. Azure exposure. You are too good. You're fantastic. All I'm right. to get you back somehow. But what if you want to just dive into uh, something in a little bit of detail? How would you do that, Clay? You want to know something specific about Azure? Because the client has said, I thought you're an expert. Why can't you tell me about Cosmos? I'd probably start with A Cloud Guru. A Cloud they're, Guru. That's not a bad great choice. Source for my AWS learning. And what's the monthly cost of that? About 40 bucks. Okay. So, yeah, similar to Pluralsight. So, basically, um, you've got to work out what your budget is. Uh, a lot of people's budget is zero. They're, that's tight ass. Okay. Uh, you, you're generally a dev thinking, you know, uh, a few hundred. 100 or you're a zero. So I kind of classified them in the Pluralsight guy or the LinkedIn learning guy or the Udemy guy or the YouTube guy at the bottom. All right, so that's kind of the, the general uh, factors that you'll sit in. All right, so um, who is the Pluralsight person? Okay, that's more than half the room. Who's the LinkedIn person? Uh, a few. Who's the Udemy person? Oh, several, okay. And YouTube, lots, more than half the room. All right, good. So there is one thing else that sits in this free. YouTube's got a bloody lot of content, not as easy to find as uh, Pluralsight or LinkedIn Learning. This one, who already knows about Microsoft Learn and has seen some of the material? Okay, so maybe a quarter of you. So this one is free and there's a bloody lot of good content here, heaps of good content. This is definitely the way that you want to uh, have a look to see if this is enough to get you going. If you've got, you know, you look through YouTube and you look through this, now is the time to start paying for some more stuff. So um, as your fundamental concepts and take you through this, this will, you know, this will, um, this will be plenty of stuff to take you through. Nice uh, self-paced learning. Okay, you know, so that's the experience there. Uh, they put a fair bit of effort into this Microsoft and this is a very good resource that you should be uh, having a look through. All right. So, the next one I want to tell you about is the Azure Developer's Guide. Anyone already looked at this one? Not a soul. Okay. Well, there might be a reason you haven't looked at it. It's a PDF. I don't know why they make a PDF. But it is a big PDF. There is a lot of pages here. There is 146 pages of PDF. Is that enough? Oh. So, and this, uh, and they update it. Every year it's been updated, but this is, uh, if you want a big PDF and uh, you want to use all the paper at work, print this one off, all right? It's, uh, it's pretty substantial, kept up to date, and this has definitely it got you know, pretty much most of Azure in here. Okay? So that's definitely worth looking through. And it's, as you can see, it's up to date, 2022. All right. So uh, that, in summary, is 140 pages of beautiful PDF, refreshed every year, covers building cloud native apps, Visual Studio and Azure DevOps, and GitHub pretty much what most devs want. That is going to keep you busy uh, for a little while. Next tip. You are just getting things going, you know, before you're getting serious, you're up and running. A lot of people will uh, go in, they'll deploy their app, they'll go to Azure portal, they'll click on the resource group, they'll choose app service, they'll go advanced tools, They'll then br browse, then, then they'll drag and drop their artifact from Windows Explorer you know, or Finder or whatever they're using if they're on a Mac. But they essentially ref are referring to this as ClickOps. Okay, I don't know. Who came up with that term? Matty? Hmm. All right, so ClickOps. So um, there is a slightly nicer way of doing it than that. There, for proof of concepts, you might want to get this VS Code extension pack. Anyone already grabbed this guy? One soul. One soul. Right. So I'm going to give you, this is your homework tonight. Go back home, grab this guy, and test it out. 
It's, uh, it's really, uh, I, think it's, I think you'll like it. Now, I will, is it, uh, basically you just come in here and uh, you'll, I think it's a slightly nicer way of using it. Have you used this, Matty? Yep. Hmm? Good. All right. So um, you can code and deploy from the same place in VS Code. You can deploy directly. Uh, you deploy directly from your app service. Um, it's, it's quick. It is for proof of concept scenarios. This is not how you should do it long term. Obviously, long term, you should be using Azure DevOps or you know, GitHub uh, Actions. Um, all right. You also have this in Visual Studio, so uh, a similar type of uh, story that you can use. Okay. Now, tips and tricks. Are, yes, Matt. So just on um, those add-ins, it's not only for deploying code. You can interact with the resources as well. So you can you know, click on them, get directed to a site. So maybe your app service has a funny name. You want to go to it. Maybe you want to look at some logs. Um, so you can see some app insights in there. If you're doing logic apps, you can look at the run history. There's, it's a mm. lot more than just deploying. Right. Okay. Cool. Thank you. So um, Azure tips and tricks. Okay. Um, now there is this site here, Azure tips and tricks. Anyone seen it? No one? Okay. So this has a lot of tips and tricks. It is run by a Microsoft guy. Uh, is this an actual Microsoft resource? It, I think it is, is it? Anyone know? It could be just run by a Microsoft employee. I, I, I'm trying to remember. Um, but yes, you can come in here. Uh, you can have a look at this. There is a, there's a lot of uh, information on each one. So there's a, a bunch and uh, I think that this also links off to other people's stuff. Okay, Any, anyone um, use this at all? Never? Okay, so I will move on to uh, the next one, which is checking latency. This is a, a Azure Speed. This um, will check your latency. So this is uh, pretty good. We could come down here and check how we're going. Now, um, I want to just get rid of this thing at the bottom. Now, I I think I have you used this, Broden? Not yet. Right. Um. Well, how do I run it? Right. So we want to compare against uh, Central US. So now we've got two. Okay. So there's your there's your testing. So you can test Australia versus US, and you can see what's going on there. Okay. All right, and the, this one uh, is the one that I've seen more of the guys using. And you can see um, how, like, obviously, Sydney is the fastest for you. Melbourne's the second fastest. But uh, did you know Singapore was next? I wouldn't have guessed uh, South India would, was next. I would have assumed that the US, since we've got such massive pipelines between Sydney and the US, would have been substantially faster than India. So there you go. Uh, totally incorrect seeing that stuff. 
you know, look at West US, it's way down here. Like there's a, the whole of Asia is fast. Hmm. Is that a surprise to you guys? Hmm. No. All right, cool. Um, now, the last one I am going to tell you about is uh, this Azure update site. All right, so let's come into here. Now, we're using services all the time, and sometimes they're available now, sometimes they're in preview, um, sometimes they're, they're just in dev. So you can come here and look at what's going on with these different sites. So you can, that's now available and you can do your queries up here. And so you might, let's just say that you're using, um, oh, what's something fairly new? Cosmos. <laughs> All right, Cosmos. Okay, that's fairly substantial. And so there's uh, Azure Synapse. What's the story? It's available, available. Um, if you want to include just, let's just choose the in preview stuff. So almost new. Okay, so we've, this is just uh, a nice site telling you what's available and where it's at. Now, um, I think one of these, let me just, is that the one? One of these sites um, was helpful in terms of seeing which ones are being updated the most. I just All right, so that, that's the update site. And this Azure Charts, I think that was the one. All right, anyone use this one? Nope, Azure Charts. So if I go into Trends here, and I go to, I'll go to latest highlights, I think. So I can see um, which, uh, which stuff is being used the most. Maybe it's, so tracking. As you hover over it, you can see here whether which regions it's supported, what's its status. It's in, in, it's in preview. And there is one here, I think, is it trend sensors? cannot find it, but there is something here that I have seen where you can see which ones are being updated all the time, which is quite, quite good. So you can see which ones are alive and which ones there seems to be no team on it because no one's updating it. All right. So, oh, is Kubernetes available in Australia? So let's, I will just give that a go. Hmm. Maybe it's the advanced view. Uh, I'm, I've, I've lost the field that allows me to filter. But anyway, this, this, this site is basically querying all the updates that have been had. And when you get into one, it ends up taking you to the, uh, to the update site. And this guy is, uh, oh, it looks like a Russian guy, but he's a Microsoft employee, okay? And he's basically just calling all the APIs he has and putting in a nice visual service. So it's not a Microsoft thing, it's just uh, done by a Microsoft employee. All right, okay. Uh, how many updates has uh, ACA had in the last six months? You can see that. All right, which services have been op optimized for cost? Um, yeah, you can get uh, questions like that answered. All right, and then they link back to the Azure update site. So lots more. Uh, that's the that's the ten. But I think you know you could talk about a lot of other things. Tears, Bryden, what's your opinion on 
tears. You do a bit of thinking about that. Okay, so for all of the Azure services, or a lot of them, there's different tiers. So for instance, standard or um, enterprise is a common pair. Typically, there'll be very different feature sets between them. So when you're designing your service, be aware that there will be some feature differences. Like for instance, with app service between standard and premium, you can put a VNet and private endpoints onto a premium, but you can't with standard. So if you if you do need to hide it behind a VNet or in ads security features, typically you have to move up to the premium tier to do so. So be very aware of those different tiers and whether you require a feature out of the higher tier and therefore you're forced onto the higher cost. Um, in terms of costing, how do you think about it? Like sometimes you do things and the cost just seems to be extraordinary for just a small piece of functionality, like you know, you're doing a query or do you, how do you think through that? Okay, so when I think about Azure architecture, one thing I tend to do is find out how Microsoft has actually architected it underneath. So one example is Cosmos. You can do, it has what's called partition keys. So queries that go between partition keys cost about 20 times more than queries that are confined to a partition. So you look at it and you go, why would they charge like that? And then you find out what they've done in the architecture is that a partition key, all data for a partition key is guaranteed to be on the same piece of hardware. So there's no network latency in there and there's no having to go to multiple pieces of hardware to do your query. So suddenly you go, oh, now I understand and I can optimise my thing because I also know that queries within a partition will be much faster because it's only going to that single piece of hardware. So there's lots of those sort of things where understanding the underlying architecture that they've built, like the physical architecture, means that you can understand how it's going to solve your problem and therefore ways you wouldn't do things or ways you would do things in your if you were building this as an on-premise app quite often apply in the, the cloud and knowing what that physical architecture was allowed you to answer that question and avoid you know bad patterns and optimize to the good patterns for what you're trying to do. Um, I may as well ask you, uh, Azure Security Center, which is now called Azure Defender for Cloud, any thoughts on that? Yeah, this is a, another one of the great things that um, Microsoft offer you. Azure Defender for Cloud, gives you a whole bunch of just out of the box um, suggestions on common um, configuration errors and things like um, you've left administrator passwords on your SQL server rather than using a Windows password, all sorts of things like that. It'll just give you warnings and give you a secure score. So effectively gamifying the problem. So you're aiming to get 100%, um, it really pushes you to, to think through what are the, the holes in your security. You can also then pay for um, advanced services under there, uh, commonly with AI-based threat detection on a lot of the services. So Microsoft will identify when suddenly you're getting unusual activity and alert you to it, or possibly even stop that activity and that as you that what is it called again now um, the new name Azure for Azure Security Center is called Azure Defender, Defender for, cloud. for Cloud yeah that's that's quite useful to, to start with the basic tier of that it's a bit basic mm. or it may now be called something else now that they've rebranded it but that the basic tier of that where you just get the security score gets you a long way through all of those things that you forget to do like flags like HTTPS, forcing HTTPS, enabling only secure encryption protocols, all the things that you forget as a developer when you deploy something, it's going to prompt you to fix all that. So before, I'm going to ask you about SLAs in a second, but I just want to talk about uh, security for a second, because um, I did a video just recently on 
uh, rules to better security. It's just got 10, 10 things in there. And it's just the most essential things you should do. Um, and, and basically, you know, uh, it's all about, with passwords, the length. And uh, ideally, you just have four, four words, of, you know, not, not too complicated, it's fairly easy to remember. Um, and I want to know, how many people here know what lsass.exe is? Okay, I didn't expect anyone to, because um, what I what I, what I learnt was, if somebody breaks in to a machine that's been compromised, uh, and that person is an administrator on that one machine, it's just a file server that you know, let's say a marketing department. It's a marketing server, right? So they're administrator access on that. So now they've they that person's account is compromised, they get onto that box, right? There is a process that runs, you just open up uh, task, task Manager, and you'll see this exe, it lives there, and you can right click on that and go dump. And you can then take that away, have a look, uh, find out who else has ever logged onto that machine, ever. And guess who would have logged onto that? A sysadmin. So now you can then come back to the machine and go, hello, well, let's, let's um, jump from that box to another box, but it is an administrator of the company. All right, so that is incredibly scary and dangerous, and that's why you do not allow anyone to be a sysadmin, all right? And there's a whole lot of other things. Um, VPN access to your company. Who, is, who has VPN access? So almost everyone, you know, it looks like. Who needs 2FA for that VPN access? And there we go, less than everyone. <laughs> that is a big deal and I would uh, recommend you talk to your IT department and show them this page. And there's a video uh, that I have about that. It's, uh, it's a common hole, there's a whole lot of other holes, etc. The best reason to move to Windows 11 for the entire company is the TPM Enhanced Security, um, and that basically is a hardware level, um, uh, it's a hardware level requirement that makes sure that the chip itself has a certain um, security protocols that require, let's say, Windows Hello, etc. All right, so that is, um, you know, that probably, uh, look, there's a whole lot of things, and this is pretty simple to say there's 10 things, but check that you do those 10 things, all right? Because I've been surprised how many people do not. I want to ask you about SLAs. What's, what's your thoughts on that? Okay, so commonly when you're designing an application, the person defining the requirements is going to, to want you to commit to something. So for all of the Azure services, Microsoft will publish an SLA, so you can then calculate the SLA that you'll be able to offer on your offering. Um, a lot of the Azure Architecture Center, they'll tell you how to, com if you um, dual deploy, for instance, what sort of increase in your SLA you're going to get, depending on whether you go dual deployed in the same region, multi-region, um, multi-continent type things and what effects you might get on other pieces of your SLA if you do dual deploy. But be aware that all of those are well documented, so you can actually then calculate out what your overall SLA is. And if you have a look on the internet, it'll tell you how to... If you've, say, got an app service that has 99.9% .9 availability, how you then combine that with um, a database that has the same, what's your overall application availability going to look like. Okay, awesome. I am going to call out one thing that I didn't put on my slides, which maybe I should have. Um, there is the uh, well-architected framework. Now, I'll just tell you a tiny bit about this. I better, I better use, oh wow, uh, I better use Google to find it. I 
goodness. Uh, well, I could fit. Okay. Uh, where is my well architecture framework? It's probably inside the Azure Architecture Centre because it is part of that yes. now. Or I thought I did a separate one. Oh, there we go. Okay. So I did do a separate one. Um, now, this is one I didn't include, but it's worth mentioning. One of the things that AWS have is this well architected framework, which basically is all these best practices you, you should follow. Uh, Microsoft also have one, and uh, they uh, basically you go through and you answer lots of questions that you can't say yes to most of the time. But here's an example, you know, um, what reliability allowances. I have this, I have this, I don't have my keys backed up, I don't have this, I don't have rotation, etc. And as you go through this, you answer all these questions. What we do is we put some of the important ones on the backlog because we're always trying to see if the client will keep this front and center. And also it makes it very clear that you know that there's an endless list of things to do. And so it, here is an example of a backlog for us. It'll have a couple of bits of tech debt and we label it as tech debt, uh, and it has these well-architected framework recommendations. So you, you, know, you look through all these recommendations, there's just so much to do. And this is just one question. So you go through and you pick out with the client which ones really matter to them. Oh yeah, we should definitely do that, we should definitely do that. And you put that on, on the backlog and then you, you, know, you see where, where you are on this list. Okay, so yes. That's that, I think we've covered plenty. There's obviously um, a mountain more, but hopefully uh, that uh, has been useful. You can scan this QR code if you want uh, 500 points and you get 500 points in your app. Uh, in summary, uh, hopefully you will use the Architecture Center because I think that's the best bang for your buck. Uh, and I would use it early on and I'd try to keep it current. Uh, bicep templates are probably the most useful way of doing your infrastructure as a code. Make sure you're very uh, across the costing, it's really important. Um, uh, I think that uh, all that, that final stuff I found fascinating to listen to, Brian, that's awesome. Uh, and be aware we have rules to better Azure, which I may as well tell you about as an example, and there is a bunch of stuff here. <coughs> Um, I, I go through way more than what we've done tonight, and this might be useful for you. Includes a bunch of what we've done tonight as well. So hopefully that's all useful. Thank you very much. So uh, we are going to just hang around for a, a little while, and then uh, we're going to go off to the Clarendon if you want, or the rest of you, you're welcome. To go home. Thanks for tonight. Thanks, Alan.